Well, welcome. I'm uh, Dr. Joe Cerami of the Bush School. Uh, this brown bag topic is on conflict and development. The exact title is Leadership in Con Conflict and Development, Working with the U.S. Agency for International Development in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and other complex environments. We're really fortunate today to have two leading experts worldwide uh, renowned experts in the field of international development, uh, Dr. Ed Price and Mr. Jerry Kenny. Ed Price is the head of the Conflict and Development Laboratory here at Texas A&M University. The, he was the founding director of the Norman Borlaug Institute for International Agriculture, uh, started uh, work in the professional career as a Peace Corps volunteer, uh, has since uh, built on a, a, a truly worldwide reputation. I've been in the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., and Rome, Italy, and people have asked me if I know Dr. Ed Price uh, because of his role in the development community. So we're very fortunate to have him here uh, with us today. He really has been a groundbreaking uh, expert, not only in setting up university programs on development, but also in working in public-private partnerships with the CEOs of major corporations in America. Um, and and a, a work, a, a, just a, a lot of opportunities for us to ask some questions about development, the role of U.S. Agency for International Development, and, and uh, the role of universities as well. Uh, Jerry Kenny is, of course, a Bush School graduate of the Fighting Bush School class of 2011. <laughs> uh, he and, and Megan came to us after touring the Peace Corps as well, where they were in Armenia. Uh, since then, he's been leading field research for the Borlaug Institute and now for the Conflict and Development Center in the South Sudan, uh, in the Congo, uh, and projects planned for Afghanistan uh, as well. Uh, he recently completed a, a year in South Africa working for the Borlaug Institute in their partnership with the Howard Buffett Foundation and the UN World, UN World Food Program. So uh, let's have a nice uh, warm Bush School welcome for our guest. And Jerry will kick it off with, with a discussion about their work in the Congo. Well, first of all, thank you for, uh, to the Bush School for, for hosting us. The Bush School is probably our closest partner at the Conflict uh, and Development uh, Lab. And to Dr. Sarami for the, for the terrific introduction, and, and Dean Crocker, both of whom are my former professors. So not long ago I was in I was in your position and, and it's funny when you when you look at some of these slides I think some people's initial reaction is to uh, well my parents reaction would be to say well what are you doing why are you, you going to some of these places that you're going to but my reaction was I really want to be there so when, when I was in your position it was immediately how do I how do I get there and how do I get these opportunities so today I want to get quickly to the question and answer part because I think that will be the most useful but right now, I want to set the stage for what does it mean when we say we go to uh, a place like the DR Congo? Uh, more recently in September, both Dr. Price and I were there. I was there for most of the month of September, and Dr. Price for about 10 days. And we did an institutional assessment. Uh, and the institutional assessment was both uh, in, in Kinshasa and then in North and South Kivu. Now, the point and the purpose of the assessment was to identify institutions, mainly educational institutions uh, in the Congo, uh, do some, somewhat of, of identify potential partners for, for later on for our programs, as well as the capacity and the research priorities for those partners. So this was a, our initial visit into the Eastern Congo as part of the Higher Education Solutions Network. And uh, I'll show you a few pictures for, for what it's like. I want to give you a glimpse of what it's like to go on the ground, the sort of activities you'll be involved in, and then we'll move quickly into to the question and answer. So I know it says I have something like 36 slides, and it's never a good idea to have that many, but I'll get through them uh, rapid fire. Uh, quickly. <coughs> so first, uh, first when we go to DR Congo, uh, you make the initial visit to the USAID mission. Sorry. Uh, that is... Uh, those are some of the mission staff and, and our team. And you just, you want to identify, uh, let the mission know what you're doing and, and how it will uh, improve their program, some sense of what they're doing on the ground, and just, just come away with, a, with a agreeing on the objectives and, and letting them know what's going on. So this was our, our follow-up picture after that visit. 
Uh, it includes uh, Dr. Price and myself as well as uh, Dr. Jindai Frazier, some people from the State Department, another former Bush School student, Gavin Finnegan's in that picture, and then uh, the team leaders at USAID in Kinshasa. Then you jump on an airplane. Uh, this, uh, this was interesting because we actually took local, uh, we actually took local flights, which was not advised. Uh, they told us to jump on the UN flights, but we didn't have time because those require lots of logistics. So this is one of the local Congolese airlines. Uh, loosely they're referred to as flying coffins in, <laughs> in DRC, but we, we had a fine experience. It was very pleasant. Um, so that's us heading to, jumping around to the, to the different locations. So uh, the first place we were is in Kinshasa. Uh, that's the capital of DRC. Then we headed, he headed to the east. So we went to Goma, Bukavu, uh, Butimbo, and Kisangani. So this is us heading, heading to the east. Then you jump in a, uh, in a car, and you spend a lot of time in the car. And uh, you see a lot of interesting things, such as, uh, such as this. You go over lots of interesting uh, bridges. This is in Bukavu. Uh, you spend a lot of time in traffic, uh, so getting to different locations. Then this is uh, at the Catholic University of Graben, which is the location that the Capstone Group uh, for Bush School the spring of 2014 will be collaborating with. Uh, this is the sign as you enter the university. So, you, uh, so we jumped on a plane, uh, got in the car, and went to about 15 different educational institutions in Eastern, uh, Eastern Congo. This is one of them. This is us. You, you head to the site and you try to figure out uh, what's going on. So this is explaining a biogas project outside of Kinshasa. Uh, and this, it looks like we're in a pretty interesting discussion. I don't know if I'm being accused of something or they're explaining it. But, uh, but you, you, you try to figure out what's on the ground. Everybody wants to show you their projects. And so you spend a lot of time uh, uh, assessing existing projects on the ground and then writing up a report so that follow-on projects, we can then use these people as a, as a resource for, for and potential partners for follow-on projects. This is, uh, this is in Kisangani. Those are members of the FRDC uh, who are working with the Borlaug Institute on an uh, agricultural production project. So actually units in the army are, uh, are learning different agricultural production skills and growing their own food so that they don't have to rely on local communities. They can actually uh, produce their own. So that's part of the military procurement program there. And that uh, was an Aggie too. And that's Andy Hell. He's an Aggie as well. He's the, he's the uh, manager of that project. Uh, this is more just collecting uh, information, collecting contacts. Uh, and then this is, this is part of the Catholic University of Graben. This is one of their vocational training programs. Uh, they have a number of these, which if you're in the capstone or you're interested, be sure to, that you'll get lots of information on. But this is one where uh, they're teaching skills to former child soldiers as part of a reintegration program. So we visited all of these different sites. This is a former, uh, the, the gentleman, or the, he's really a, the teenager in the red shirt, was a former member, uh, former child soldier that had been through a woodworking vocational program, and he had started his own business. Uh, that is, that's where he's operating currently in Bukavu, and so we visited a few of these uh, former child soldiers that had been through the program. Uh, it was raining that day, so they asked us for a tarp, but we didn't, we didn't have one. Uh, this is also at the Catholic University of Graben. This is their emergency, uh, sort of emergency room area, and you can see people there uh, waiting outside. Another part of that capstone project will be on child malnutrition programs, effort to combat child malnutrition programs. So we took a look at those as well. Now this is uh, also part of the Institute for Peace. This is at the Catholic University of Graben, but it's an example of programs that uh, they simply ran out of funding about six or seven years ago. So this has been setting like this uh, for a while. And you see lots of this in, in, in situations like the DR Congo, where programs were started, but due to violence or due to lack of funding, they, they then just kind of sit there. So they're always looking for continue, continuing funding to finish these. But it looks like a terrific uh, building, of course, but it just, it's just sitting there. It's, uh, as of yet, it's uh, not put to any use. Uh, this is inside one of the, the classrooms we were at. Uh, we, when we visited the educational institutions, we wanted to get a sense of are the, are the, uh, are the classrooms continuing? Is there a sense of normalcy in terms of, of classes are going on, they're not disrupted? And at many of the institutions, uh, when we visited USAID in Kinshasa, there, 
uh, we're skeptical as to the capacity and the quality of some of the uh, universities, but in many of them uh, we visited, people are overcoming all sorts of odds and continuing violence in places like Yoma to continue classes. And any, any of the classes that they had to cancel due to violence, they were making up in the summer. So this is an example of a course that was, uh, that was making, up, uh, making up that lost time. This is the, uh, the agricultural, sort of the extension program or research of, of the uh, DRC government agricultural uh, program. This was a lab that the, uh, the local expert that we were working with had, as she was going through college, she worked in this lab, but uh, they had a large group of refugees that, that came into the community due to conflict, and the lab was stripped of all of its equipment. So uh, it, was, it was very interesting to see the effect of, of conflict and uh, the effect of sort of uh, continuous, uh, continuous effects on these institutions that are trying to do things like research. And in fact, this, this current lab in its shape here uh, wasn't effective. It wasn't in use because everything had been stripped. Now this is an example of a lab. This is in Kiss, University of Kitsangani where research is continuing due to a grant uh, a grant from a Western institution. They were pushing forward with agricultural research and were very proud of the equipment and the, and the sort of research that they had, they had ongoing. Uh, and um, it was an, another uh, example of the type of things people are doing, even though you hear mostly terrible stories out of Eastern Congo. There's actually a lot going on and there is a basis to build upon in terms of, in terms of research capacity and, and continuing programs. Then I'll just quickly go through slides. Uh, these are all the meetings that we had over the course of three weeks. And as I said, we, we met with about 15 different institutions. So when you show up, uh, you have your questions ready. You, uh, uh, you visit each different institution. You meet with the leadership there. And, and you just keep at it. You, there, there's always going to be challenges when you're in your <coughs> like this. So sometimes you have to meet in your hotel room. Sometimes you have to uh, cancel meetings and, and jump back and do four in a day. But you have to keep going and you have to keep, keep visiting. So we met a lot. Of, uh, of terrific people doing good work and, and pushing forward in, in really, uh, really amazing circumstances of what they're doing. This was a women's organization in Bukavu. They, uh, they're working with uh, victims of sexual violence uh, and, they're, and they're growing. They have a large staff and they're doing lots of different programs. At the end of your assessment visit, there's always time for uh, pictures and I'll show you uh, a few of those uh, that you always have to do. So. There's a number of different pictures. That's the staff of the Catholic University of Graben that we're, that we're working with in the spring. And that's the staff of the Catholic University of Bukavu. Uh, and that's an agricultural university in, uh, in Kisangani. And of course, when you go to uh, places like the DR Congo, there's always lots of interesting things you'll see. And the, the last few slides I have are just examples of, of what you'll find. In, in Goma, if anybody knows the history of Goma, uh, a volcano, lava, uh, went through the streets, and so they're actually breaking up the lava rocks and using it to build uh, uh, to build walls or houses. So I thought that was really interesting. So right there in the middle, there's a giant pit, and they're breaking up these large lava rocks to use uh, for all sorts of things. Here, this is outside of Kisangani. You can see in the back, these are fishermen that are using giant nets, and you'll see them sort of in the water there. But they put them strategically throughout the the river to catch uh, to catch fish. Uh, that's another really interesting, they, they actually climb on, uh, climb on that wooden structure and pull the nets up at the end of each day, so that was another really interesting thing uh, we found. And I thought this was really interesting. It, <laughs> I, as you notice, my pictures all have me in the same jacket because that's my traveling jacket that, uh, that hides dirt really well. This, this picture was at, uh, in Goma and they had a peace rally that we came upon. And these guys were sharp. They were dressed really well, and um, I just thought that was really <coughs> cool. And then, <laughs> the, the, these were children that, of course, you're going to attract a lot of, of attention at, uh, as you go uh, in these different communities. And um, <laughs> that's an expert, yeah. So I, I liked it because uh, I'm being stared at here, and I have a camera, and obviously the kid in the front is not impressed uh, with, with whatever I'm doing. But uh, another uh, really good example of the, the type of attention you get, in the, and uh, it's always, always really fun uh, when you go to these communities and look at the type of resilience these communities show. And here, this was also in Bukavu with Catholic University of Graben. And they're working, uh, they have former child soldiers that were uh, in the vocational training program working 
all throughout the city. So at this point, we were we were visiting them, and of course, they, we had to take a picture. They had an Ameri the State Department had set up an American uh, corner uh, at the University of Kissingani, so we had to take a picture with our president uh, there. So they got they got a kick out of that. So that's that's quickly to give you a sense of a basis <coughs> of of what we're doing, the type of things you'll see when you're out in the field. And, and now I think it would be good to, to maybe uh, answer some questions and, and some of your questions as well. So thanks. Thank you. I'll sit over there. Did you notice the Bush School t shirt in that one? Yeah, and again, the world over. Let's start with uh, Dr. Price. Uh, one of the questions we've had is uh, successes and failures in the role of international development in your experience. Would you like to tell us about some of those? Great. Um, yeah, one of them, one of the greatest failures, I guess, that I've experienced it was not that long ago. It started in Iraq. Um, we had a project with USAID, and they wanted a very big part of it to be uh, education for students. And so we, A&M, took on the role of um, training, uh, getting graduate degrees for a number of Iraqis. We wanted to keep the program very small, maybe 10 or 15. But when, uh, when the funding came through, somehow the word had gotten out that there were six mil there was $6 million available for this. So immediately they divided by how many, how many students could, could be supported on $6 million. And the Iraqis were very insistent that we bring 50 students to the U.S. And I said, we can't do it. It's just, you know, it, that's, you, we can't handle that number. It's not enough money. We scaled it back, scaled it back. I tried to hold out for 15, but ended up accepting 32 or 34, as I recall. And uh, bottom line is that in the end, those students did come to A&M. About five survived the program. The rest had to go home. And simply because they never got TOEFL exam scores that enabled them to matriculate. But it was a heartache almost from the very beginning. You know, you were trying to do the right thing, and uh, I've often thought, at what point could I have made a different decision? Should I have held, could I have ever held firm, <laughs> lost a friendship or two, and said, only 10 students can come, or only 15? Could I, I, I rejected the notion of their staying there to learn English before they came to the U.S. because projects are not very long. You know, it takes two years to learn, you know, it would, it would have taken two years for them to get TOEFL in their environment there because they're in an, Iraqi-speaking environment. So I thought, well, get them to the U.S., they'll learn English faster and so on. So we brought them all here. I wondered if that was a good, a good decision. There's so many nodes in that entire process that I would like maybe one of you, if you ever want to do a study, of at what points could we have made a different decision that would have made this a greater success than it was? Or, you know, in, in the end, we've declared it a, a success because five students got degrees. And that's actually a higher success rate than many other programs have working with people straight out of a conflict situation. Of course, what you're working with are people who have been uh, hiding. In fact, in order for them to apply for the scholarship they re that they received in about 2007, six or seven, in order for them to meet me, they would have to take three days of travel, even though they may live within three or four blocks of where I was, they would have to hide their route for coming to see an American uh, organization. They would go to visit a relative in another province, another relative in another province, and finally they would circle in on us, hoping that their path had been covered in that process. So it was really, um, there's so many parts of that experience that I wish I could change today. Uh, and then, but in the end, we're calling a success simply because there are five you know, success, success stories out of it. Jerry had a hand in it in helping them feel at home here. Maybe some of you uh, had a hand in making them feel at home here. But that was really one of the um, failures from which I would like to learn and I think it should be documented. But um, the successes, or go a different direction, I guess. Before we went, uh, I'd already been working in Iraq on various occasions with uh, Development Alternatives Incorporated and with Chemonix, different organizations. But the, last, but the last and major engagement that we had was sponsored by the Department of Defense under a group called the 
TFBSO, the Task Force for, for Business and Stability Operations. Uh, the brilliant leader of that, Paul Brinkley, you may see one time he comes through College Station occasionally. Paul Brinkley led that and I said, Paul, how, how are we going to be a success in this situation? And it's amazing. Paul is a sort of a hard-boiled entrepreneur, businessman, and you would not, in his normal manner, you wouldn't think of him as being tender-hearted. But he said, you can see it in their eyes. He said, I guarantee you that the reward for you will be, become clear in the eyes of the people whom you meet and the notion of giving hope. And sure enough, from a standpoint from a success, I think we continually wrote up what we regarded as one of our greatest achievements was be, befriending people and giving them the courage and hope and interest in carry, carrying on. I can remember going into the city of Najaf when had been a terrific battle there and uh, people didn't even get close to the city center. But when we went there, we, we met with the mayor and he just, tears are streaming down his face. He said, we don't need your money. It's not money we need. We need your friendship. You're the first civilians to come and talk to us and make us feel as if we deserve to be in the world and that we deserve to be uh, carrying on our work. He said, you've given us courage to stand up from behind the barricades and begin to work. Uh, I have one, one slight spin on that. Um, one day, after that, I was p helping somebody put a luggage in the luggage rack on an aircraft um, and uh, um, sat down beside her and um, she said she was a psychologist and I was still right in the middle of this work. And uh, I said, um, and I said, boy, you could really help me. He said, I told her, I said, I often feel guilt. Has anybody heard this story? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and he doesn't want me to tell it. And I said, um, does any, uh, I said, I really feel guilty when I meet, when I go out widely in Iraq or widely in Afghanistan, I'm meeting villagers, I'm meeting farmers, I'm meeting businessmen. And there's always seems a presumption on their part, because you're there, you're going to make their lives better. In fact, my own ambition is to make their lives better. That is why, why I am there. But realistically, I know that probably I will never help that person with whom I'm speaking, because when, when a program comes, it may be in a different area, may be in the same area, but not help that person. So I always have this sort of overbearing, overhanging feeling of guilt that I am implicitly making a promise that I'm not going to deliver on, that I really am not probably, in their case, I may not be able to, to really make a difference. And I just explained that to the young woman, and she said, I said, Ed, don't you understand? I, I, she didn't know I was Ed at that point, but um, she said, do you ever pass beggars on the street or homeless people on the street? I said, oh yeah. She said, what do you do? Do you recognize them or do you turn the other way and walk by? And I said, well, I usually try to say hello even if I don't give them money or something. She said, yes, we all know that you really should recognize homeless people or beggars on the street to give them a sense that they are human. Even if you don't give them a coin or a dollar or whatever, at least you're giving them self-worth by recognizing their existence. She said it's the same thing in these villages. You're, you're recognizing them and giving them the hope to carry on, and whether you help them or not, and, and that in itself. And that was sort of what Brinkley was saying to me. I said, wow, that is so profound. I said, would you join us on our teams? She said, oh, I'd love to. I'd do it if I could, but I can't. I said, why not? She said, well, I have a history. I said, how could you have a history? You're you're young. I said, well, I said, I've worked, you know, I was at DOD, but I'm not, no longer there. I said, well, that's not a problem. And so she took out her boarding pass and said, this is me. I said, oh, okay, you're Jewish? She said, yes. I said, that's not a problem. It's, sure, it's a Muslim country, but we have lots of people who are Jew Jewish who are working with us. That's not really an issue. She said, yes, I'm Jewish, but that's not the problem. And I said, well, and so we chat about other stuff. And then while I was thinking there, I was visualized her boarding pass, and then I realized, I said, is your first name Monica? And she said, yes. And I said, are you Monica Lewinsky? She said, yes. I said, oh my gosh, now I understand. But 
that was the most, but, but that story, she rent, we had in, tremendous conversations the rest of that plane trip about politics, about psychology, about development. And it was actually, I think that that was, I will always value that lesson. And in fact, it, it sort of, it struck at home with me better than it ever would have that, you know, that this engagement, just your simple engagement with communities gives a worth, gives worth, and it's a value in its own right, although we should always try to help, you know, really make a solid difference as well, but anyway. I, I can't follow up on that. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, don't have, I didn't meet anybody special on the plane, but I'll say um, I did start my, my first, I started as, a, as an intern and then a graduate worker at the Borlaug Institute. My first project that I worked on was this Iraqi scholars program. And um, I didn't know the history of, of bureaucratically how it shifted among TFBSO and then USAID was involved and the U.S. Department of Agriculture was involved. So a lot of people worked hard to get the program, uh, to get the program going to where it could, it could start up and, and even continue. Uh, and I didn't know that history. All I knew when I was managing it is that we had 34 uh, Iraqi uh, adults here trying to learn English who were not native English speakers and the program was under uh, a lot of pressure and in fact we realized quickly that the program was not going to succeed in the timeline that that we had uh, that we had set out for it so we we're trying to communicate this to our donors uh, and of course the donors had worked so hard to get the program pushed through they didn't really want to listen so uh, that, that's one lesson I've taken is when do you question your assumptions and when do the incentives really not align with, with the types of things when you're implementing a program and you're coming up on difficulties, it's kind of one of those locks where all the pieces have to align before a window opens up to change it and to make it more effective. And unfortunately in that case, it waited till the end and we had to sort of scramble uh, to get something for those Iraqi scholars who weren't able to continue with, uh, with their degree program. So one thing is, is, is questioning your assumptions and then at what point does, does, do, do things align in the incentive structure with your donors, with the implementing partners, and then with your partners on the ground? Because if they don't align, you're going to have a lot of friction and you're going to have a lot of time spent trying to get them aligned. So, so that's one thing I learned from the Iraqi scholars. Another thing in terms of a, of a failure goes back to really constantly reevaluating your assumptions. And this happened in South Sudan. And it, and it relates to another uh, institutional development project that we were working with in Bor in Jongle State. And if you know much about South, Sud South Sudan, Jongle State is, is the most conflict-affected uh, state uh, in South Sudan. So we get to South Sudan, we get on the ground, and we've just written, written this giant USAID project to do an integrated extension teaching and research program. Well, the assumption is that they have capacity, at least a foundation, to begin doing some of those things. What we didn't realize is that, in fact, the teachers hadn't been paid in months. Uh, the faculty hadn't been paid in months, staff hadn't been paid in months. They haven't had a new uh, entering class of freshmen in three years uh, at the university. And the, they couldn't be paid because the oil, the, the oil had been shut off between, between South Sudan and Sudan. So in a situation where the teachers are on strike, the students were living in tents but then got kicked out of their tents, so they were on strike. Uh, you have to question, is it still viable to, to begin to deliver the sort of goals we had initially? And oftentimes it's not. So for people that are working on the ground, I think it's important always to, to identify what is the theory what, and make it simple. What is the theory for how this program is going to work? What are the assumptions behind our theory? And then do, do those assumptions hold? Because if they don't hold, you can't pretend that the program is going to work. So uh, in terms of failures or successes, uh, that's, been, that's been sort of the lessons I've learned in that. Why don't we uh, shift to uh, questions from the audience? Uh, and while you're thinking about that, let me, uh, let me ask an obvious question. Uh, uh, I'll start with Jerry and then go back to Dr. Price. Uh, so a uh, danger and risk in these situations, you're on the ground, you're in a country that's not very stable. How do you prepare for that and, and what kinds of actions do you take to be able to protect yourself? Probably should answer carefully since uh, we're at Texas A&M and this might get back to the risk management people. <laughs> uh, so you always have the number in your, in your or the card in your in your pocket so if anything happens there's been times we've been in South Sudan uh, and DR Congo not not this last DR Congo trip but before where uh, if someone's gotten sick really sick Bo, Bo was sick with malaria and uh, when when you're really sick I know there, 
there was an army doctor. A lot of things make sense on the ground that don't make sense as I'm trying to retell this story. But there was an army doctor that was trying to treat Bo, and he was, we had a lot, we were skeptical, and we should have been skeptical because it didn't work, and he got, he got much worse. Uh, but we, we, had a, we had our number, uh, and you call, and they were going to have to emergency flight him out for, for medical problems. So uh, as much as you can, uh, work, uh, do your background research, always have, a, have a, some plan in your head and written down uh, for what you would do in a situation. I think the most important thing, and I learned this from Peace Corps, is that uh, maybe some Peace Corps volunteers that are here, your neighbors are always your best security. So if you can work with really good people on the ground, whether it's a logistics person, whether it's somebody you've already visited before. So when you get to a, uh, I think, uh, when you get to a situation, be humble. Don't assume that you know what to do. So your first time you go to a place uh, before you're able to make your own contacts, rely on good partners. Uh, rely on good partners, be prepared, think it, think it out. Those would be my, my suggestions for, but you can't always mitigate the risk. There's just sometimes, it's, it's dangerous. There's, you're not always gonna, gonna be able to say, we're 100% secure at this point, because a lot of times, you know, when you're out in these situations and, and gun trucks are running by, and it's, it's chaotic. So uh, you can't always be 100% secure. You're assuming some risk, uh, that's just part of, of what we do, but there's things you can do to, to mitigate that. Yeah, I think um, uh, networks are very, very important. We've had teams working in Afghanistan who work entirely below the radar, and when they move about the country, they've made contacts far and wide through informal networks, but people who know what they're doing to say, yes, it's all right to travel at a certain time to a certain place. So that's one, one way that, of uh, being engaged safely. Of course, of course, most of the time we've been in above the radar uh, or in the radar uh, kind of situation where we're traveling in convoys with bodyguards and so on. But I have enormous respect and I think there are going to be more and more requirement in the future that we work under the radar through networks because as you know in Iraq or Afghanistan, or Iraq presently you won't have U.S. Uh, protection and Afghanistan we won't know what that looks like exactly in the near future. But we have to be prepared to work through civilian networks of, uh, that you can trust. I guess how you deal with fear, I never, I didn't really want to be in dangerous situations and I always worried how would I behave in a dangerous situation. But you know, they just come up on you unexpectedly. And the human body is, the human body and mind is enormously resourceful in helping you get through things. It just becomes like life. It just becomes, you know, you deal with it. Often you don't realize how much tension you, you are under until you're away from it. And then you just fall apart. I can remember one of the first times I came out of Iraq. And in, um, in 2000, actually I went in the day that Saddam Hussein was captured. And so it was about two weeks later I came out. And I went to the, I was staying at the Hyatt Hotel and I ordered a beer, and when the waiter came to me with my beer, I was bawling, just, just tears rolling down my cheeks. I could hardly speak, and he says, what's wrong with you? And I said, and I, you just, I didn't know what the emotion was. It was just the relief of, of being away. Well, while you're in it, you really don't feel that way. You don't have, you, your, your body, your mind, really helps you take care of yourself in those situations. And while Iraq was scary, I guess the time when I was felt most threatened was in the Ivory Coast when I happened to have gotten caught behind the lines in a revolution there. And uh, couldn't move anywhere. I was, I was in a building occupied by rebels. I was talking to them. We got to the point that we were drinking unsafe water. We were, didn't know where our food was going to come from. And so it was really pretty tense. And I had plan after plan about how to escape. Every day I spent a lot of my time thinking about escape and what avenues to take and what I would do. But above all, my most dominant feeling was to be brave. I mean, I wanted myself to be brave. And I said, no matter what comes, you have to be brave. And I don't know how, that, how others deal with it. I'm thankful that I've never got to the point of being under just very obvious. And I, I didn't clo narrowly escape any particular cases, although that did occur with our team and with the task force and many others, but still, the body, 
I think you rely on, on your inner resources and you know that uh, it's regrettable. It gives me, last night, if any of you saw it on uh, 60 Minutes, they had a segment on um, post-traumatic stress disorder and how it's being dealt with today in the military. I, I just feel enormously compassionate toward those who have been affected and feel like a role that we can all play is, is to learn how best to deal with that disorder when you meet and work with people who have it because they've given enormously for our country and I think we need, and we need to deal with it that way. But I, I'm proud to be from A&M because the way I've always put it, A&M is enormously and rightfully proud of the young men and women that we expect to protect our nation and, um, and, um, and work in defense of liberty. So I feel honored to be able to play a civilian role that is a counterpart to what to what our military does. And I think it's a very honorable role to play and, and we've got to do it, so. I'll just add, uh, long term, in the short term you can't do much about this, but long term uh, and always, be cognizant of, of what you're doing and how you would be perceived by local communities, so some amount of, of empathy. Uh, I remember one time that it really bothered me, we're, uh, I was working uh, with the World Food Program in Sierra Leone and we were cruising in these big SUVs all throughout uh, rural Sierra Leone. And uh, the problem was that, of course, the, you, know, you would run through these villages, they had a pretty good road, but people kind of stared at you as you went by. The problem was we were running over all their chickens and goats because we were on this very aggressive, do you, you might have been on that. So we had hit, yeah. But you, you think about that and the, and the perception of us, we would like to help these, uh, help these farmers. We were there to do an assessment of this agricultural production project, the purchase for project, progress program for the World Food Program. So for the villagers' perspective, you see these giant white SUVs cruising down, running over. We hit multiple chickens, and we had really knocked out uh, goats. And I don't mean to be flippant. That, I, I thought this is terrible, because they see these people, largely these white people driving by in SUVs, running over all their stuff. And I'm like, why would they ever, uh, why, would they, why would this be a good thing? So they, they see us cruising through there, hitting all their stuff, and actually causing damage. So in that sense, I think a, a lot of it is, yes, you have to take security preca precautions, but if that comes at the cost of, of your perception in the community or you're losing faith because of those security precautions, you have to balance that. You can't be so secure that you're, in fact, uh, doing harm to the communities you'd like to, you'd like to help. Okay, we have two, ma'am, and then Kevin. Can you just talk a little bit about um, going to these places uh, as a female, like if there's any recommendations you might have or like places that you can't go or maybe you should stay away from? Yeah, there, there are different situations. Of course, the military has female warriors as well, and they go everywhere, do everything that the men do. And so, they're, so women do have roles in, in combat situations and are, are great. I mean, do, there's no no difference. Um, and I think in most occasion, in most cases, uh, it really depends on where you are. There are a lot of play. I guess there are few countries in the world that I would be reluctant to send uh, female staff on their own for sure. Um, and it's n and it's not conflicts at countries necessarily. Um, I would just. Uh, but but countries where the role of woman women has uh, is not the same as it is in the West and where a Western woman is going to feel very vulnerable and maybe be put in very compromising situations. So there are cases that are that would that one should avoid as a uh, as a lone female working with a team with a mixed team. Usually you there's you can probably go into most situations in a mixed team without feeling any particular concern. Uh, we, um, and we had uh, female civilians on our teams working in both Iraq and Afghanistan, and I have no reservation about placing women there. In fact, they're necessary, absolutely necessary to, in order to understand many situations that we face. I would say, uh 
uh, for me, most of you know Megan, my wife. She's been everywhere I've been besides DR Congo. And I would say it's absolutely essential. If you have a team of only men, you're going to miss out on so much. So having Megan there, oftentimes, um, I'm, Megan opens up way many more doors to our team than I could ever open up to get that other perspective. So you're, a, lot of, you know, a lot of these pictures you see just men sitting around shaking hands, that's not, I mean, that's not the way, that's not effective uh, a lot of times because you're missing out on a whole other side. So to me, it's essential to have, to have women as part of it and, and to include them on, on everything you're doing. So uh, I would say that it, it's a necessity. There's certain security precautions, of course, but I haven't seen that those are any more uh, dire than, than what men would, would, men would assume. Do you want to come on? Uh, yeah, because it's, it's a great question, <coughs> uh, and uh, you both had uh, excellent responses. Uh, uh, you both remember uh, Amanda Edgel. Mm -hmm. um, uh, she spent a summer in Kisangani uh, uh, as part of a team uh, from Borlaug, uh, basically uh, trying to uh, uh, help teach uh, Congolese soldiers to be sort of an armed agricultural extension service. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, had a terrific time. Yes. Uh, the broader point I'd make is in um, many of these societies, uh, Western professional women um, uh, are informally accorded the status of honorary men. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they are not seen as or treated as uh, uh, women indigenous to the country. They, they have a special status, uh, which um, in, in my experience uh, uh, not only makes them more effective, but uh, serves as a, an additional security factor uh, for them. And you're absolutely right. Uh, <coughs> in so many of these societies, certainly where you've been looking in the Congo, in the South Sudan, uh, uh, women play a very important role in the economy. Um, and uh, you are not going to relate well to them, if at all, um, in, unless you've got women on the team mm -hmm. to, to make that connection. Mm -hmm. I agree. Thank you. Kevin, you had your hand up before. Yes. Uh, regarding developing the kinds of local networks that you gentlemen were talking about, are there any general strategies that you found useful, or are there general methods for developing local buy-in and local trust? I think that's a, a really good question and, and should be a, a part of our research is in, um, in conflict and development. I was just thinking about it this morning that one, one whole area of our work should be exactly that. How do you build networks uh, to protect you and support you during times of conflict? I can remember so many situations where I've seen it play out in Afghanistan in this, this married couple who worked with uh, nomadic uh, herders, but fanned out all over the country, moved around, but by knowing the local networks. I don't, I think we need to try to establish a, exactly what you're asking, maybe build a guide and sort of collect the best of what we know of how to build these. In this particular case, a group called Mercy Corps was already operating in country and they had begun to develop this network and so we built on theirs. But it was through, and it's not, I guess one lesson is to have multiple contacts. In every situation I've been in like this, it was, we would get two or three different independent reports from different people about whether it was all right to travel that day or not. Um, and these would be, and, and they would be different and separate informants because uh, one may be wrong or one might get compromised somehow. Uh, one of the things that was like used very often in, in uh, Iraq was working with Kurds in, uh, in the central Iraq region. Now, what was happening here is that the Kurds are, are and Kurd families are very close-knit. It's all for one, one for all, but they are themselves alien to the culture in and around Baghdad. And that by working with a Kurdish informal security teams, we had a degree higher level of confidence that they would not be compromised because they themselves though familiar with the area, were not culturally integrated with the area, 
so that where they could be more easily uh, compromised. I think there th that's a, it's a really good question. I really like for us to work with that more and more to identify these methods of, of, of assembling these kinds of networks, how to use them, how to protect them. Uh, of course, good, the good rules are being honest and, you know, um, and valuing those relationships. I'll give you one quick example not to compromise them. I was visiting this, this peace team, the, the couple who was operating under the radar, but I was traveling with the task force the TF, from the DOD. I wanted to go visit our other team, and so I'd persuaded the task force to give me a ride over there. Well, of course, they ride in up-armored vehicles, one in front, one behind, and me in the middle. And so went roaring over, to, and they actually, and they, by their stand, standard operation, they had to uh, reconnoiter the area first before they would take me. So they spent half a day preparing for my visit. By the time I got there, they'd managed to completely arouse everybody's attention because the vehicles had been going. Everybody wondered, well, who's coming? Where are they going? So when I came in in the vehicle, they, my Aggies, who were working there, ran out of the building and said, get those cars away from here as soon as possible. Hide in the back. Do not let them stay here. And so I said, please leave, please leave. And so they went away. Uh, so that, so I almost compromised, maybe did compromise some degree, my, my Aggie colleagues who were operating under the radar by having them be seen with people operating with armed vehicles. Another funny thing along that way, the first day I was out for a ride in Baghdad, right in the thick of things, um, I got in the vehicle, I put on my seat belt, and they just practically screamed at me, said, don't put on the seat belt, they'll know you're an American. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they're funny. Yeah. My response would be, one, the, the purpose of the network. I mean, what are you, what are you there to do and, and acknowledge that when you, anytime we go into a uh, situation, anytime anybody goes in uh, and has a program, you're contributing, the intervention's contributing new resources. So you're changing power dynamics in the local community. So acknowledge that, realize that you might be shaking things up. You're gonna benefit some people that might come at the cost of others. So one, acknowledge that. The other thing, I don't think there's any shortcut to building a network. If we never go back to Congo, all of this time will have been wasted. I mean, the network will dissolve. So there's no sustained engagement is the only way. I don't think there's a way to do it on the quick. I think there's ways to keep in contact uh, using communication technologies, but most of the places that we're operating in Congo and South Sudan either have very limited or no access to, to, to the internet. So you have to keep it up. I mean, you really have to work on, on staying there. And you know, people that have been to the Peace Corps, the, the second year is much more rewarding than the first because you built contacts. Because uh, you have a network, because people trust you, and people know uh, you're there to stay, even if only for one more year. That's so. I don't think there's a there's a shortcut way to to, to do it. Dean, you want to weigh in? Uh, yeah, just very briefly. Uh, Dr. Price mentioned uh, <coughs> Mercy Corps. Uh, I, I serve on their board, uh, and you know our our mo is uh, just as you describe. Uh, uh, we rely heavily on. Um, local residents. Uh, uh, we, we give them the same training that we would give an American uh, member of the Corps, I mean to that professional standard, uh, and uh, rely very heavily on them uh, for situational awareness. Uh, and it allows us to do things, for example, uh, in Syria. We are the only significant uh, humanitarian NGO that is operating throughout the country in rebel-held areas and in government control areas. Nothing mm -hmm. else will do that. Um, and we're able to do it because uh, we figured out how, how the politics work uh, and then recruit individuals mm -hmm. who will bring out, will train, and then they'll go back in. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a very, very light uh, uh, U.S. presence. Uh, we have some. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, you're right, there is no shortcuts, but we have found building local networks. They are Mercy Corps employees, uh, but they are from that particular, not just country, but that particular area. 
Yeah, and I think uh, a lot of, I was talking with Andrew Natsios, and that's what World Vision was doing as well. I think, I forget what country he mentioned, but the whole country staff, the whole staff is, is local. They don't have any expatriates there. And uh, it, was a, it was a problem in, in Boer, South Sudan, where our project was, uh, one of the, the other NGOs was Catholic Relief Services, and they had said it took seven to eight months to train an American to come there, and by that time, most of the time, they were ready to leave. I mean, the, the, the circumstances are so difficult that they were looking for someone just to stay a couple years. And when you're in that situation and your turnover is that high, it's hard. It's hard to build, uh, to build a network, invest so much in someone, and then they go, and they go straight back. So I, I don't think there's a, a better way than to, to invest in, in local. We're going to be out of time pretty soon, so let me, if I could, work in a couple of questions anyway. Uh, so, so Bush School students preparing for, for work in international development, what kinds of things should they be thinking about doing while they're here? Well, I, I think there are things that you're probably already doing, but, you know, I'm always a big one for saying, you know, Peace Corps is a very good experience to have behind you if you want, if you intend a long-term uh, career overseas. Uh, short of that, learning a foreign language or more than one foreign language, and it's not so much that you will use that particular language in another country, but the fact that you've begun to understand and think in, in any other language helps you to be more sensitive and, and responsive into uh, another society. Those would be uh, two other things. I think um, it's not just travel, it's transactions in another country. You know, very, we have study abroad, and I'm a big supporter of it, but too often our study abroad programs just, you know, try to establish an American community in another geography. And, and unless it involves intense interaction with uh, conducting transactions in that other society, you're really not learning very much. So I think conducting projects conducting anything that requires you to understand the other society's values and to respond to the other society's values, that is the key, you know, and, and that's what will we'll take you forward into the future. But forcing yourself into those situations that require you to conduct valid transactions according to another, to the rules and regulations of another society. I, I would say uh, in terms of development, getting that initial start or jump into the development field, the Peace Corps master's degree, degree combo seems to be something that's working for a lot of people. So the Peace Corps experience and then following that up with the master's degree, it doesn't matter what order it's in, but that seems to be for, for that entry level, that seems to be working for, for a lot of people. Just following up, I had written on my card, uh, go to the field. I mean, if you really want to know, go to the field, not an embassy, and I'm not, there's nothing wrong with that, not an embassy or not a classroom in the capital. Go to the field and stay there for a long time. If it's not Peace Corps, then make it something else. But don't just go for a month and uh, go to the field for a long time. And, and then, in, in some ways, have your, uh, I, I said, have, I wrote, have your heart broken. I don't mean that badly, but I think a lot of people that haven't been to the field and, exp and, and, and been able to immerse themselves in, in a lot of frustration uh, don't have, they, th I think they put more priority on the design of projects, but not the implementation. Because you can design, we can all get together and, and draw the lines that connect the dots, and it looks really nice on a PowerPoint but it's not gonna work because you don't know what it's gonna be like to, to implement that thing. So my, my advice would be to, to go to the field for a long time. Dr. Price, do you have any final words? Maybe you can tell us a bit about the kind of work you're doing in the Conflict and Development Center here at Anna. Yeah, it's, uh, it's much different than anything that we've ever done in the past with a development agency because we've worked with World Bank, USAID, USDA, many others. Usually our job is to implement a program th that delivers goods in another country. It's building a road, forming a club, instituting a new policy, just all kinds of things. It's all about implementation. In this particular project, we're not, we're, our job is not implementation, but it's to learn the lessons of implementation. That is, try to develop principles, guidelines, models, rules, that will inform the Agency for International Development about how to go about working in a conflict situation, how to go about working in a post-conflict situation, or what works to prevent conflict. So what we're supposed to come up with in the Conflict and Development Project program is one step removed from implementation. It's building the models and tools, principles and theories 
that can be carried forward and applied in other places. It's a very idealistic um, objective. I think we can't develop those without implementation. So what we are typically doing is that with some fundings, working to, with an, an implementation project, but encapsulating that into an intellectual framework within which we can learn about what about the implementation is working and how can that be expanded to others. So I hope that every project that we do, like even in South Sudan, they want us to do a marketing study. Okay, we'll do the marketing study, but we want to learn from that marketing study of what impact better markets have on conflict and what rules can we derive from that study. Uh, I'll say briefly, just uh, you have a terrific opportunity at the, at the Bush School uh, with, this, with this Conflict and Development Center. Um, and the Bush School has uh, increasingly a, a history of putting people in the Borlaug Institute programs and in, in our conflict development programs. When I was in Kisangani, a uh, Bush School student from my class, Armando Rojas, he's the newest Bush School graduate, the fourth Bush School graduate that either the, that the Borlaug Institute has put in Kisangani. The Bush School, the, the sort of things we learn at the Bush School is very valuable. Uh, and so ha learn more, come visit our center, try to get involved. And, and I hope the, the history, we're, we're gaining momentum. I, I was complaining to, to Dr. Gwandi, we need more development uh, faculty. Well, that's happening. I mean, you're getting a terrific development faculty. It's growing. There's momentum here at the Bush School, and there's momentum throughout the A&M campus with what we're doing uh, for this type of work. So thank you. Go for it. Dean, you have any, you want to make any final comments? Or? No, you said it all. <laughs> well, thanks. It's always great to have uh, uh, students come back, especially knowing that they're, they're personally advising President Obama about uh, U.S. Uh, Africa <laughs> policy. I've got the picture. <laughs> uh, so please, a, 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 round, uh, a warm round of uh, thanks and applause. <laughs> and thank you all for, for coming. Conflict and Development Center is just down the street. I know we've got a lot of students working at that. And so everybody,